Welcome Stanford alumni, Tigers, Googlers, friends and guests. My name is Chris Lowe, Stanford Business School class of 1991 and the events chair of the Stanford GSB Asian Alumni Chapter. Along with Denise Peck, GSB class of 1985 and our chapter president, moderator Sun Yu, MBA 1993, Ivy Chu, MSM 2009, Kathleen Lehman of the GSB Alumni Relations Office, Jennifer Liu, Asians in Finance at Google, and Norm Liang, Asian ERG at GoPro, we're all delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, the untold story behind Altos Ventures, a VC firm that invested in both Roblox and Coupang, two of the 2021's biggest IPOs. We're very excited that Ho, Han, Anthony, and Larry are joining us tonight. It truly is an honor and a privilege that we have them here to share their story with our community. The Altos Venture story starts in 1996 with Stanford Business School Roots, a single limited partner, three GSB professors and a $30 million fund investing in early stage technology companies. This early support came from a group of surprising partners an unexpected community of investors who also understood the idea of being marginalized. Today, Altos Ventures manages more than $10 billion in regulatory assets. What learnings can we apply from Altos's experiences securing their early funds? What is their investment purpose and philosophy? What can the unconnected Asian American entrepreneur do to overcome unwarranted stereotypes and successfully raise a VC round? Tonight's, tonight's panel will examine these questions and many others from a practical on the ground perspective. By the way, please note that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions for the moderators or panelists, please enter them in the Q&A box. Let me start by introducing our moderators. Soon Yu is a best-selling author and expert on innovation and design. His book, Iconic Advantage, challenges businesses from Fortune 500 to companies to venture-backed startups to refocus their innovation priorities on building greater iconicity and offers deeper insights on establishing timeless distinction and relevance. He most recently served as a global VP of innovation and officer at VF Corporation, parent organization to over 30 global apparel companies, including the North Face, Vans, Timberland, Nautica, and Wrangler. Prior to this, he worked as a general manager at the Clorox Company and Chiquita Brands, as a consultant at Bain & Company, and as a founder of numerous venture-backed startups. In addition, Soon recently published an article on, for Forbes titled, Who Owns the AAPI Brand? From Stereotypes to Stories. I hope you get a chance to read it. Ivy Chu is the Senior Director of Digital Strategy at Royal Bank of Canada where she leads the product team in building a digital platform to provide financial services and advice to over 2 million clients. Prior to joining RBC, Ivy launched and scaled a product consulting team at LinkedIn in Asia Pacific and was a management consultant at Bain & Company's Southeast Asia practice. Ivy has also served as a guest speaker at the Stanford Business School in recent years on topics of organizational culture and employee engagement. So without further ado, Soon, please take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'd like to take a moment and really acknowledge Chris's leadership. Um, without you, we couldn't have pulled this together. And uh, I also wanted to just say that uh, we've had an amazing turnout. So I want to thank the audience. We actually have uh, almost 700 people registered for this event. And that's uh, usually we were around 300. So this is about double what we normally see. So a lot of demand and enthusiasm about this event. And I'm very excited to be able to moderate this event. Um, it is an extreme pleasure because and privilege because what we're gonna be doing today is really talking about some great stories from the AAPI community. And what's really great about telling stories and promoting is that we've got some wonderful actual heroes behind these stories in terms of what they went through to get to where they are today. And let me tell you, it wasn't always easy. And just as important, we're gonna be talking about stories of allyship where support came from other communities uh, to really help us get to where we are today. So these are wonderful stories that we can't wait to share with you. Now, 
what's our goal today? Obviously, we want to learn from these amazing heroes and the supporters that were behind them. And I know from that, you're probably thinking, oh, I'm going to take away some best practices about being an entrepreneur or maybe even starting a VC fund myself or maybe leadership skills that I might apply to my teams. Of course, we're going to cover those things. But what I really want to share with you is maybe another point of view. And it was actually captured in the title that Chris created for this program today. And the single word I want to focus, is, focus us on is the idea of untold. You see, there are untold heroes in this story. There are surprising supporters that came to the rescue of these heroes. There were untold moments where I think some of our heroes were looking down at the abyss and thinking, what are they going to do with what's face, what they were facing? And then obviously there are untold lessons inside of that. And that's what we really wanna focus on today is the untold whys behind the what's. So I would ask you as audience, pay attention to those. Cause I think beyond learning some practical skills and some best practices, practices I think what we're gonna learn is some real life lessons that are gonna be able to be applied in whatever you're doing and in terms of whatever type of situation you might be facing, okay? Um, so let me introduce the panelists here. And I'm gonna start off by actually not giving you the bios. You can find those on LinkedIn. And let me just say, obviously there's some themes. They all, uh, the three partners we're gonna talk to today, they all work for Altos Ventures, okay? We know that part. Uh, another common theme is uh, they all graduated from the Stanford Business School. Um, and surprisingly, all three of them have consulting backgrounds. I, I don't know if that's a corollary to success or to, to some of the early failures that they had, okay? Um, but those are the commonalities. Um, I also wanna share some stuff that you may not be able to read through the bios. Um, I've spent a lot of time, actually I've known Ho since uh, we both graduated from college. We were in our first job together at Banning Company. Um, and I've gotten to know both Han and Anthony through this process. And there's some themes about both them as a team, but also Altos Ventures that I think is really important. First and foremost, if you were to meet them sitting next to them at a, you know, in an airplane or just on the street, you would have no idea that they're behind one of the most successful VC firms in, in the entire US, in fact, globally. I would say they're probably, in terms of returns, in, in Korea in the last few years. What an amazing track record. But if you met any one of them, you would find them down to earth, very humble, and very, very much, um, uh, very focused on you, actually, is, 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 is uh, one of the other qualities that they all share. Um, the other thing is they're all actually very proud not to be venture capitalists or uh, all the accomplishments that they have. They're proud to be parents. They're proud of their kids and their families, and they're very involved and active in their communities. Uh, so these are individuals who are very much involved in our community. And, and lastly, I will say something. Um, I asked each one of them, if they weren't doing this, okay, what would they be doing? And all three of them answered <laughs> Individually, they answered the same with the same answer, which is, I would continue to do this, even if you didn't pay me, because they love what they're doing. And um, I was in a conversation with Han a couple of days ago, and he shared something with me. He goes, you know, every day I get to sit across from people that are people that you'd meet in TED Talks, people that are going to be future visionaries, people that are trying to change the world, people that have passion in terms of it, you know, index like 200% of what other people have and people that have courage because they want to try something new. How can you not love your job when that's what you're surrounded with every single day? And to be able to be the confidants for those type of people, Han said it was very humbling. And I think that was probably very true for both Anthony and for Ho when I asked them the same questions. So if you're an entrepreneur, wouldn't you love to go pitch to Altos Ventures, knowing that the way they view you, they view you as future visionaries, as people who are gonna be up there during the TED Talks. So that's what makes, I think, Altos really unique, is that humanity that they bring both to their personal lives, but also to why they're doing their profession, okay? So with that as a context, and with that as sort of the knowledge of who this team is, how did this team begin? And 
So I'm going to turn that over to you, Ho. If you could sort of help answer, how did Altos become Altos? Wow, soon that is such an unbelievable introduction. I think I'm going to have to knock us down a couple of pegs so that we can <laughs> start from the beginning. But it's it's great. Thanks for having us. And I've known soon forever since our very first job is out of college. So it's been an amazing journey that we've taken together over all these decades. So, so my personal journey with Alto started with a phone call in the fall of 95. Han gave me a call. And Han said, hey, you know, remember Professor Jin Wang from GSB? You know, he's got this investor who, who needs help in venture capital. And I think Han called me because he didn't know any VCs probably other than myself. And I happened to have done some VC work after Bain uh, prior to GSB at a firm called Trinity Ventures in the early 90s. And so we started talking about it and, and we actually put together a little business plan. And the recommendation to this investor was, oh, you shouldn't get into VC right now. This is not a good time. You know, because you know, 95, it was after the Netscape IPO. To me, I didn't know any better. That felt like, wow, very frothy market. You know, compared to 1991, which was a recession year, I think the entire industry maybe raised a billion dollars of funding, the entire industry. Right now we have companies that are raising billions in funding, you know, potentially in a single round. So, so anyway, that was the advice. And the investor came back to us and said, well, you know, why don't you guys maybe get started in a small way? And if it, if it turns out that the market crashes later, we could put a lot of money behind you guys. It's like, well, really, you know, and they were doing big deals. Like they put $200 million into one company. They could do that kind of a big deal. So 30 million to them felt like a small thing and said, geez, if, if we get involved, maybe we can, uh, we can take advantage of uh, market opportunities on the road. So that's kind of how we got started. And, you know, we took a pretty, uh, customary approach. We were just this tiny fund. We were focused on small deals where we could be hands-on investors, very old-fashioned venture capital. And we thought that gave us a little bit of an advantage because it's an advantage of, of, of small size. All these venture funds were starting to get bigger and bigger. They couldn't afford to spend too much time on these tiny little deals. And we really wanted to partner with the best VCs but we didn't want to follow them into their deals because we didn't think they would show us any of their best deals. Like, who are we? Like a bunch of young kids from Korea. Like, who, who the heck are we, right? But if we did the work early on and if we got them to come into our deals, you know, hopefully we could learn from them. And of course, investing, getting started in 96, January of 96 is when we all got started. Uh, that was a pretty good time, you know, because just about every deal we did, it seemed like we were getting big step ups in valuation from, from, uh, from kind of some famous investors, right? So that was, that was pretty good. And then what ended up happening though was, you know, we've gone through so many near death moments. In 98, we kind of faced our first existential crisis. Uh, and that was related to the, if people remember the long-term capital management blow up uh, related to the Russian ruble crisis and the Asian financial crisis. Well, it really hit Korea very hard, and our single investor was out of Korea and almost put them out of business, and uh, they were having a very difficult time meeting the capital call commitments. And so we thought we had this fund, but we really didn't have any money that we could draw on. And so we, um, we scrambled and trying to figure out how do we survive, how do we even pay our salaries and rent? And, and we were able to find Silicon Valley Bank, who looked at our portfolio and they said, hey, look, look at all these good companies because they bank everybody. And they work with a lot of the VCs that were co-investors in our deals and say, hey, these guys are really good VCs that invested in your deals that validated your companies and they were banking many of our companies. And so they decided to give us a $10 million line of credit, which is kind of crazy in today's regulatory environment that would never happen, but it went all the way to the CEO and the CEO approved it. So that gave us this lifeline, $10 million lifeline to pay our salaries, pay our rent, and to be able to continue to support some of our companies as they did more financings. And then as the bubble continued on into the, well into the 90s and you know, 99, you know, things started to clear up again. Our portfolio continued to perform and our LP was back in business. And so all of these things were happening and we thought, geez, you know, maybe we're pretty good at this. Uh, and then maybe, maybe we should be expanding, you know, and that's what led us to Anthony. But before I introduce Anthony, so in 99, kind of two things happened. Uh, one is I went to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting for the first time. And of course, 
We had all known about Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett from Professor Jack McDonald, who was one of the, our advisors uh, from day one. But I had never really spent too much time studying him and just being there that weekend in the peak of the bubble in May 1999 and hearing how he operated and how that whole community operated. It was so different than the little Silicon Valley bubble, right? And so that was kind of the beginning of a journey of how do we marry the fundamental investing principles of Warren Buffett with what we were doing in Silicon Valley VC. And, and people thought that couldn't be done. And that was kind of a dumb idea. Buffett doesn't even like tech and he doesn't like VC. So how can we combine it? But that kind of got us on a 20 year journey to figure that out. And we'll talk about that later. The, the other thing that happened in 99 was I had this interesting conversation with one of the uh, original partners at uh, Trinity. And he was on the board of Starbucks when the company went public and he had kept all of his shares, all of his board shares, as well as his distributions from the funds. And the company went public in 92. And I thought it was, wow, that's kind of remarkable. You never sold a single share. It's like, why is it that the rest of the partners and the rest of the partnership sold, right? Well, VCs have all these pressures to get the exits, get liquidity. Um, and and you know, soon after IPO, basically you sell or distribute. And we thought, geez, you know, if you look at the value creation in the venture industry and in tech in general, so much of the value creation happens after IPO. And how do we capture that value? How do we create these enduring companies and then continue the compounding for decades? So that's another little seed of an idea that started back in 99. And it took us 20 years to kind of figure out how to do that. And we'll get into that a little bit more as well. And so going back to, uh, 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 how Anthony comes in. So we're thinking about basically expanding now. We're doing so well. And, 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 and we wanted to recruit Anthony because he was one of the best marketing people we knew. He was in charge of marketing at Evolve Software, which was our very first investment in 96. He left the company prior to IPO. And then he pitched us in a startup. And we turned him down for that startup. But then he got term sheets from two top tier VCs and he came back to us and said, hey, look, I got term sheets from these famous VCs. I still want you involved. Like, why don't you participate? And we turned them down a second time because we <laughs> said, like, well, no, no, that's not our model. We don't follow other VCs. It's like we want them to follow us, right? So we turned them down second time, but we really liked Anthony. And we started to think about basically, you know, calling on him when we thought that the company maybe was kind of uh, on the ropes. Right. It's like, ah, so how is that startup going, by the way? Right. And, and anyway, we were convinced Anthony to join us in 2000. He thought we were going to be this, you know, very successful VC. We had all these IPOs in the works and then it all kind of started falling apart. But Anthony uh, joined us and he stuck with us. And then we could kind of take it, uh, take it from there uh, on some of the lessons of the fundraising in that difficult dot com era. And, and basically dealing with the triage, basically, of all these difficult uh, uh, situations that we had to go through for the next several years before we could raise a fund. So take it away, Anthony. Well, before Anthony jumps, I do want to just summarize what I heard, because there's a lot there. This is pretty amazing. When you guys started, it was sort of an idea. You had this great LP, and you guys were off and running. And then basically, let's say the global financial crisis happened. And then you guys went through hell, OK, your first hell, right? And then from there. You, your LP kind of disappeared on you, right? And, and you didn't, and it's really interesting. You guys actually had to get bridge financing, which most, most of the portfolio companies have to do. A VC firm actually had to go and get bridge financing to actually survive and to thrive. And then I guess you were able to turn the corner on that for a few years. And from that, I guess you, you painted this rosy picture and convinced Anthony to join you. But we all know what happened in 2000 with your entire portfolio. If everyone can just sort of you know, take a time capsule and go back to the heydays of great valuations and all those dot-com parties. You remember every, every, every night there was a dot-com party, right? What happened a few months after that is what Anthony, you inherited, correct? That's exactly right, Stephen. And I remember walking into the office, the very office behind uh, Ho there and looking on a whiteboard in Han's office and he had written up three IPOs, three companies that were gonna go public. Uh, Two of them ended up going public. One of them did not go public. And we lost money on all three of them, including the two that went public. And it was shortly before that, that I had, when I had joined, I told my wife, you know, 
I think I finally made it. I made it to the venture capital promised land <laughs> and we're going to make millions. And I'm going to be sitting in this office, writing checks and saying yes or no to companies coming in the door. And I learned a lesson very quickly that venture capital is not a buy side job. Venture capital is a sell side job. Hmm. And for the next five years, I got on the road with Han and Ho and we, we went out and tried to raise money and sell. And to this day, that's, that's our mentality is we are in the sell side business. We have to convince investors to have faith in us. We have to convince entrepreneurs to take our money. We have to convince candidates to join our, our companies. So uh, that, that, that was one of the first hard lessons I learned soon. And for the first five years, I didn't make a single investment at Altos. We were just trying to survive. So you talked about the first time that our LP kind of went out of business and we got the bridge loan. Uh, shortly after the financial crisis, they went out of business again with us and said, you know, we, we can't come through on that $100 million that we promised you. So my very first job, instead of celebrating these IPOs, was to hit the road and figure out how to fill them in, how to find a, another investor to take their place, which is something that is rarely done and, and uh, something that we just had to learn how to do. So we were successful in that and met some great people along the way. And then after that, the next job was to actually go raise a new fund. Uh, and, and this is the fund that we set out to raise in 2001. And uh, I remember uh, that, you know, most people say, well, you, you know, raising a venture fund is not that hard. You just go to the LPs and uh, they give you commitments. It takes about three to six months. Well, it took us four years from front to end to raise $68 million. So I think we set some kind of record for time spent per dollar raised. Uh, we certainly spent uh, uh, set some kind of record for for LPs that we met along the way that said no to us. Um, you know, you said 700 people registered for this webinar. I think we met more than 700 people along the way, uh, flying all around the United States, going to Europe, going to Asia, and uh, you know, you, you made a comment earlier soon about not recognizing us if we were sitting on a plane. That's because we were sitting in like 21F way back in the back and, and, and uh, <laughs> running around trying our best to raise money. So what did we learn during this, this period? Um, well, we learned to persevere and uh, you know, we, we never really questioned ourselves because we had no choice. We had no other alternative. We weren't going to go to another fund. We weren't going to go do another job. Once you become a venture capitalist, you're pretty much unqualified to do anything else. So we just had to make it work. And, Wait, is that one of the lessons, that last one? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So those of you uh, thinking about venture, two things, uh, four years potentially to raise money. You're on the sell side, not on the buy side. And once you're a venture capitalist, you're kind of, I don't know, ex, you're kind of excommunicated from every other job. <laughs> Continue. It should be your very last job. It should be your last job for good and bad reasons. So, I, you know, I think we learned something in, in the fundraising process that is, is applicable to anybody out there who's thinking of raising a fund or even raising a fund for a company. And that is that you have to have a few things. You, ha you have to have a strategy that people love. You have to have a team that people love and maybe is, is known and has done, done some things together. And you have to have an excellent track record. Unfortunately, we had none of those three things in 2001. We had a track record that was not yet realized and actually negative at the time after the bubble. We had a strategy that was sort of Avis, we'll try harder. And then we had a team that was totally unknown to the limited partner community because before that we had had only one LP. So we really had to make people like us. We really had to persevere. We really had to go through many, many no's to get to yeses. Uh, and in fact, some of our, our, our very best LPs said no to us several times. And then the, the fourth factor is sometimes there's an X factor. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes there's some kind of connection. Sometimes there's a special mandate. Sometimes there's, there's something that an investor is trying to achieve or they have a thesis on your space or your kind of firm. And that's a little bit what happened to us in 2002 and 2003. So in that period, there was some interest from the pension fund community working with fund of funds to look for emerging managers, these new kind of younger, uh, funds, some of them spinning out of larger funds. And uh, emerging managers was also a pseudonym in some cases for uh, minority managers. Mm -hmm. And in our industry, you know, minority managers were generally thought of as African-American or Hispanic. And a uh, three Asian guys on the road 
you know, we didn't really fit into the mainstream and we really didn't fit into the classic minority definition. And I'm sure many people in this audience have had that feeling before, but we were definitely kind of in that awkward middle. Mm. We were lucky enough to come across some people in the limited partner community who were thinking very far forward in terms of what needed to happen to the industry, the kind of diversity that needed to be in the industry and the kinds of people that they ought to maybe take a bet on, the people without a great track record strategy or team. And we were very lucky to, to run into a gentleman, gentleman named uh, Lawrence Morse, Dr. Larry Morse, who's gonna join us on the call here. And before I introduce Larry, who just popped on here, I'll say that we had all sorts of experiences during our fundraising trip. We, we, I remember we fell downstairs, we got stuck in airports. Uh, in one particularly bad meeting, we walked out of the office, totally dejected. This was in Santa Monica, California, and literally a bird pooped on my suit. So it was just one of those Providence. things that we just had to walk, we just had to work through. But then we met Larry and, and, and Larry is such a gentleman. It was, it, was a, it was a long courtship. We met him in 2001. He committed to our fund in 2003 and we didn't yeah. even launch the fund until 2005. So he was very patient with us. And I don't think we gave him a dollar back until much later than that. So Larry's stuck with us all these years and, and uh, I wanna hand it over to him now. Well, thank you for that introduction, Anthony. And it's such a privilege and a pleasure to be with you guys this evening. Uh, listening to you tell those early war stories uh, really took me back and in some sense reminded me very much of um, our own firm's uh, initial beginnings. When, when My partner, Joanna Price, and I co-founded Fairview back in 1994. We had a very simple thesis. Uh, we saw an opportunity set of what we believed to be talented, capable, experienced, diverse fund managers who had hitherto not had significant success accessing the broader capital market and a very small number of institutional investors who had at least indicated some interest, some openness to identifying non-correlated assets for their portfolios. And so we thought we could bridge the two. It didn't take us quite as long as it took you guys to raise a fund three, but it did take us two years out of all sorts of meetings. And we have kind of war stories and scar tissue of our own, but we raised that fund, the first fund in September of, we closed in September of 1994. It was just shy of $100 million. And of course, today, like you, we manage $10 billion and some 30 customized commingle uh, funds of funds, as well as uh, customized single client funds. But at the time that we met Altos back, at, as Anthony pointed out in 2001, we had three funds under management. Uh, the Altos team at that time had two, all from, as they've noted, a single investor. And they were on the verge of attempting to um, engage in this first broad institutional capital raise and that would become fund three. So we, as Anthony pointed out, we did take our time uh, to get to know them, um, but that's our process. Uh, sometimes that's shorter than others, depending on what your touch points are, if you will. Um, but it starts with the people. And so as we got to know these guys over time, there were a number of things about them that were particularly compelling, starting with the people. Um, obviously, these guys have very stellar uh, educational credentials. They'd gone to Princeton and Harvey Mudd and West Point. They all had MBAs from Stanford. But then they'd had work experiences at a number of really um, world-class firms and companies. There was Bain and Booz Allen and Coopers and Libran and McKinsey, Procter and Gamble, Silicon Graphics, uh, Trinity Ventures, whom we knew well. Um, so they've been exposed to and succeeded in some very challenging and demanding environment. So kind of point number one. The second thing was, and this may strike you as counterintuitive, but it was important for us. They made a number of mistakes in their inaugural efforts as fund managers. And that's not at all uncommon or unusual for first time fund managers. But the thing about these guys that was somewhat different, and it was obvious from the beginning, is that they were very methodical, rigorous, and disciplined about identifying their errors and learning from them. So we had this sense that there was this nascent culture of continuous learning within the firm mm. that they embraced, that this was important to them. And we saw that as extremely positive. They developed a very clear sense of the things that they did well and that they intended to build on. 
And they also had a very clear sense of the things that didn't serve them well, which they intended to uh, discard. So we caught them at an inflection point, if you will, and that was important. The third thing was, as a team, and this is really important for first time fund managers, because one of the one of the primary risks you take in our business with first time fund managers is that the team won't cohere under the pressures of this business. People don't understand how hard and grinding this business is. And these guys had faced some very significant, not one or two, I mean, a number of very significant adversities as, as, as whole characterized it. And I think so accurately near death experiences and yet they hadn't turned on one another, right? And they hadn't abandoned ship. So it was obvious they were committed to this common effort. They were committed to helping each other becoming better at what they do. And that was a real uh, star, um, you know, kind of on the ledger, if you will, from our perspective as we evaluated them. The fourth thing was it was clear that they had a real discerning eye um, for identifying and attracting high quality differentiated deal flow. I mean, if you ever spend time with Ho, Han, Anthony, and listen to these guys deconstruct an opportunity, um, it's very clear to you that their investment acumen and ap aptitude are just, just top shelf. They're just really sharp. They think well as investors. And, and we, we, you know, we were able to, to pick up on that, and it was important to us. And lastly, they had surrounded themselves with a small group of a very wise, loyal, uh, seasoned mentor advisors uh, from both Stanford Business School as well as the engineering faculty, um, including, of course, whom they referenced the inestimable uh, Professor Jack McDonald, who many people on this call will, you know, know from his legendary courses in private equity and investment management and, and entrepreneurial finance. So ultimately, we reached the conclusion that this was a team that was deeply committed to working with talented entrepreneurs. They wanted to build world-class companies, but they were equally intent on building an enduring venture investment franchise. And that was appealing to us. And we decided we wanted to be uh, supportive of that effort. And so ultimately we committed to uh, that next fund and the, and the fund after that. Uh, as Anthony pointed out, it took them two years um, to get to a first close. We kept our open for that period of time. Uh, there were certainly moments during that when my partners looked at me and wondered if I was uh, crazy uh, for doing this. <laughs> um, but I really believed in uh, this team um, and was committed. I had conviction around it, was committed to doing it. And so we stuck with them. But the last point I'll, I'll make, and, and then I'll shut up uh, <laughs> soon before you kind of give me the hook. There was also a sense of, of identification. I mean, as I, you know, Anthony talks about the 700 plus, you know, kind of meetings, if you will. Because we committed early, we fielded a number of calls, if you will, diligence calls from people who were evaluating the Altos opportunity for themselves. And, you know, people sometimes ask some pretty weird uh, questions that are pretty revealing. And it becomes obvious to you that some of the things that people were concerned about or that were causing them reluctance or hesitance weren't rational. And it reminded me very much of the experience Joanne and I had had as we were raising our first fund, going in and out of a number of environments where after a couple of minutes, it was clear to you, people's eyes would glaze over. They weren't taking you seriously. They were applying huge discount factors, not simply to what you said, but to who you were. In some cases, it was obvious within moments of walking in the door. Um, and it was clear when you walked out the door that you'd never hear from those people again. Um, so we had a sense that some of what they were facing, uh, you know, had elements of that involved. And, and that too, quite frankly, made us all the more determined to be supportive of them. And of course, as they pointed out, um, they've obviously gone on to be tremendously successful. We've been more than amply rewarded for, uh, for our patients. Uh, and we're grateful, quite frankly, to have been a part of their journey. So with that, I'll, I'll shut up soon. No, thank you, Larry. And Larry, I know you and I spoke, and, and I think that last point is really an important one. And that's where the basis of allyship was formed, was sort of this ability to have empathy for being discounted before you even step into a room, before you even open your mouth, just because of who you are, what you look like. And I just found that very powerful. And 
I know the other things that you said are important. And by the way, those of you who are either going to be trying to raise money, which almost every entrepreneur or any any uh, LP or sort of um, um, venture capital uh, wannabe uh, will be doing, and you should take uh, the, the 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 factors that you mentioned. But I think that last one is so important in terms of, um, and, and for you, it wasn't actually traditional um, because I, I think you had a, diff a slightly different mandate. And when you had to go back and tell your LPs, actually, I'm investing in an Asian uh, venture capital firm that was probably a, a probably surprising but not surprising too at the same time. No, yeah, yeah no, it, it wasn't as surprising as as you might think for the following reason. Uh, one of the things, and and there was no way for the Altos guys to have known this at the time they were getting to know us. Anthony may know this now because he subsequently became really active himself and involved with the National Association of, of Investment Companies. But my partner and co-founder Joanne Price had been president of the National Association of Investment Companies for a decade before we teamed up. And I had been in the business since 1983. The NAIC as an association at the time had some hundred plus member firms, most of which were minority enterprise small business investment companies. And the people running those companies were African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic uh, Americans, Native Americans. So it, 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 the, the, meeting the Altos team was not something you know, kind of out of line or strange, if you will, uh, for me or for us at Fairview. Uh, we were simply focused on what is it that they bring? What differentiates them? What particular special sauce or special sandbox that they define in which they will take on all comers? And we have a compelling indicia that they're likely to be incredibly successful. That's what we focused on. We, I'll say this last thing. I mean, there's a, there's a reason our firm is called and named Fairview. We chose that name deliberately because we wanted it to be the case that whenever any individual set foot in our door and sat at our table, if they came to the table with a compelling investment thesis, they had talent and experience that suggested to us that they could be successful. They merited a fair view. Full stop, the end. We could care less what your packaging is. This talent is distributed across all groups. And the problem with the capital markets all too often in this country, the way they have functioned historically, they're becoming somewhat better, but they're still skewed to a certain degree, is that they ignore huge repositories of capital, I mean, huge repositories of talent, talent. present themselves in packaging that just doesn't look like what they're used to. Um, and they miss it and they're missing out on opportunities. And it's, it just absolutely drives us nuts sometimes. Um, you know, and so look, if you're gonna sit there and miss out on, you know, extremely talented team like Altos because you're blinded by their packaging uh, or because you bring certain biases to your, to your evaluative processes in this day and age, shame on you. So. Thank you so much, Larry. And that's such a, such a really inspirational story. And I know for Altos and I've, I've talked to the team um, you were their first institutional investor. And in many ways, um, you validated uh, the rest of the raise, I think, which took, I think, four years to raise. And, and so that, that's very surprising. The fact that you stuck with them for those uh, you know, two or three years after you had committed is truly amazing. So anyway, great story. Thank you, Larry, for your participation. And oh. you know, without you and uh, without the team's ability to I think learn from adversity, as you were saying, in terms of this mindset of continuous improvement without the team, not learning how to support each other through the adversity and not turning on each other. I think that's, that's right. incredible. And then having, as you said, a network of great mentors to sort of fall back on, right? Um, you know, in some ways they, if I look at them, my analogy to them is they were a startup, right? And they were a startup that was going through the, the hiccups and the ups and downs of a normal startup. And Anyone that's probably been in a real startup has no, you know, a real startup that uh, uh, it, it wasn't just a unicorn from day one. Uh, you're going to go through those moments of near death. And that's right. the fact that you were able to support them, you know, that has actually allowed them to really blossom. And, and so that was kind of first decade for Altos, a lot of a few highs and quite a few lows and deep lows. Right. And as, as, from that experience, obviously, a lot of great lessons learned. I love how Anthony talked about sort of the three criteria that people look at investing, how you guys didn't meet any of them. <laughs> Anthony is great. And then, Larry, your sort of five or six sort of qualities that you look 
for, for an investor. So I'm curious, all these lessons learned, right? In terms of what people are looking for and what you were looking for, Larry. Han, I'm gonna turn it over to you. This next second decade. So this is sort of after the two, call 2004 on, how did you apply those learnings to have some of the amazing sort of successes that you've had uh, both in Korea, but also in the US? So, you know, between all these rejections, we obviously had a lot of time to talk amongst ourselves, to talk about what we did wrong mostly. Um, and, you know, I think in the early days when we thought we were good, you know, we were, I think, fairly smart enough to latch on to lots of interesting business ideas. And we realized that as long as we got the sort of the founders of these companies to make a bit of progress on management hiring and potentially offer themselves up to a to be very open to getting a CEO into their mm. companies, as long as we got them prepared and we put that package together, we took it to a you know sort of we call uh, the larger venture funds, traditional venture funds. They would mark up the price and invest in a high valuation. They put the new CEO in, then the bankers start showing up. And the companies were ready to go public. It was literally like that during the bubble days of internet. And so we obviously thought that was the formula for being a very good venture capitalist. And when the rug was pulled underneath from us, we really, in all these companies, and Anthony mentioned, you know, all these companies that were ready to go public, you know, they just went away and we made, you know, we lost money on these. And we realized, okay, that was obviously a wrong formula. So we gotta, we gotta think about what, so we actually, you know, the whole talked about going to see Warren Buffett. So we talked about, hey, you know, the stuff we actually learned at school about, you know, maybe cash flow positive business, building one by one great founders, maybe that's the model we need to go to. So we sat down and, and I distinctly remember all of us talking about, okay, let's, you know, we had shitty luck replacing founders. So let's, let's invest in a founder and let's not even think about replacing the founders. Wow. If the other guys want to replace the founders, we should almost always have an allergic reaction to it. Let's just make sure we could support the founders. And second thing was, you know, we just hate being sort of, I, I guess, set aside by larger investors. So that means let's make sure our companies are fairly capital efficient. We could, we could turn on a dime to sort of sustain, you know, with whatever capital we raise at that time. And so with these two formula, we started on a fund and, and after a while, you know, we, I think we went a bit overboard because then we realized hey, our companies are fairly capital efficient, but they're not really growing that quickly. So I, I, think, I think it was Anthony that actually brought it up. Hey, but I think we need to put growth in there. <laughs> and we said, you know, that's a great idea. Let's make that into another sort of, and, and that literally kicked in sort of, sort of middle to towards the end of the first institutional fund. And, and, and basically we started applying those lessons and we actually ended up putting a very high bar on the founder part, just because now we can't replace them. So we have to be fairly sure about them being able to take the company for many, many years. So then it was more around what can we do to make sure the founder could take the company from ground zero, maybe perhaps all the way into the IPO. And that just meant a lot of encouragement, a lot of coaching, training. At the same time, you have to have certain ways for founders to cash out so they, you know, they don't suffer for a very long time. So we came up with various innovative ways. And we were much more open to those kind of ideas than probably other people so that they could um, stay for a long time and, and become successful. And, you know, I think with all this, then we realized our universe of 
companies that we want to invest in, you know, it's a, maybe a small subset of a lot of other great companies. And if other people invest in, in a company, they put the new management team in place and they become successful, we're like, that's fine. Because as long as the way our companies do well, we really don't care what other people do. And so I think we ended up developing a fairly distinct way of identifying what we like, what we don't like. And that didn't mean that what we liked was better than others, but it was just the ones that we like. And, and, and I think we were able to stay focused on it. So if I were to just put like one example company where you know, we got to put a lot of these into practice was uh, Ua Brothers out in Korea. Um, you know, when we met the founder, the founder didn't, you know, as Larry said, it, 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 he didn't come with a complete packaging. He, um, he had a furniture company, online furniture company, which he failed. Uh, he was in debt. Uh, and so he went back to work for a, a large company so that he could pay off some of these debt. And, and meanwhile, he and his brother, you know, decided he wanted to tackle a business uh, sort of and the restaurant mobile. He wanted mobile and restaurant business. So that's when he started uh, Ua Brothers. And he didn't go to, a, you know, top college in Korea. He went to two year design school. Uh, and, and when we met with him, you know, he did all the hard things, all the labor intensive stuff to get the restaurants in place. And, you know, we heard the story and we thought, hey, this is the kind of entrepreneur we, I think we typically love and we invested in him. Uh, and then after a while, you know, he got to, he got the company to about $10 million run rate. And he's like, hey, I got the company to this. I'm not the guy to take it to a hundred million dollar level. So let's search for a new, he actually suggested getting a new CEO. And we said, you're crazy. I think you could take the company to a hundred million dollar level. And I think he stayed up every night, but he woke up early every day to read tons of books on leadership, how to run a company. You know, then, you know, you see him with a desk with wheels on and if, if product side had problems, he just literally took his desk to where the product team sat and he would he just worked with them. And if the engineering team had problems, he just took his desk, worked with them. I'm, I'm pretty sure that came out of some book that he read, but he literally learned on the job uh, to you know, make himself a better CEO. Uh, and you know, the other day, he's like, Han, the person that just sort of reconfirms sort of our, um, you know, maybe the way we think about the business and growing the business, it worked out. Not all businesses work out like that, but, and I think Anthony has another sort of a story on, on Roblox as well. Very Before similar. we move on though, a couple of other things, because be between the 10 million, when he thought he couldn't take it to a hundred and a billion, he also came back to Han at 100 million and said, wow, we're doing amazingly well, but you have the wrong man for the job. Because I don't see how I could take it to a billion, right? But now that he's at a billion, now he, now he finally thinks. So, you know, these, these things happen. It, 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 you just don't decide. You, don't, you can't figure it out up front. Uh, you just kind of figure it out along the way. The other thing that happened is by, by the time they hit 10 million, there was a lot of pressure from the board to take the company to profitability and take it public. Because in Korea, you could take a tiny little company public and you have to be profitable. Uh, and so it was, it was the March order, orders were to, to get to profitability so you could take it public by the time they hit 20 million in revenue. And we thought that was the wrong approach. Uh, hey, this is actually working well. This is the time to actually step on the gas, right? And by the time we got to hundred million, we were profitable, right? And now it's, it's quite interesting because in Silicon Valley, we're viewed as these, as these very old school, pragmatic, conservative VCs. We're not like go, 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 you know, go big or go home types. 
But in Korea, that was seen as, wow, these guys are really aggressive Silicon Valley types, right? Because we wanted to step on the gas at 10 million when it's going really well. Uh, but we were not the kind of guys to say, you should burn, burn, burn at 100 million or a billion. It's like, you got to get through profitability, right? And we saw the path to profitability. And we have the same exact strategy in Silicon Valley as in Korea. But because the business cultures are so different, in Korea, we're viewed as these aggressive company builders. In Silicon Valley, we're viewed as, as these conservative, pragmatic types. But we have the same exact formula, same approach to building companies uh, at either geography. So I'll pause there. You know, I want to pause also and just, just acknowledge that I, I want the audience to acknowledge that this is a very different investment thesis or philosophy than what most of the venture capital community is exposed to or, or sort of follows. And I don't know if this is a marriage of East and West. I don't know if it's Warren Buffett and VC, but a couple of themes I pulled out from this is you guys invest in relationships, right? And I know, I think uh, uh, I asked each one of you about the other to, and you guys all paid each other compliments, which was really amazing. And, but what Anthony says is, what Han does is he spends a lot of time with his extended family. And he described the extended family as all the entrepreneurs and founders and um, the executives and all the companies. And he has meals with them because he loves food and he loves people. And he has found a job that he can combine both of them. And, and so that's one of the theses is that you guys invest in people and the relationships. And I thought that was very powerful. The other is that this idea of continuous learning, both for you guys as a VC fund but also in your companies and also in your founders, investing in them in terms of development. Um, and, and to me, the, the last thing I would say that I thought was really interesting is that you guys build good, build good financial habits early on before you think about what Anthony's asking for, which is let's scale like crazy. Because once those financial habits and practices of let's say getting to profit or being leveraged with what little cash we have, right? If you have those then, putting more money into it gives you a lot more confidence because they're not going to blow it, right? And they're going to ask three questions before they spend something or do a little more research, figuring out how can I get more, maybe a two or three X versus one. So I, I figure I just wanted to acknowledge that's a real different investment mindset. Um, and so Anthony, how, how are you taking that and applied it to another huge success that everyone's all crazy about, which is my son loves, obviously, Roblox. Yeah, soon. I mean, uh, we learned a lot of that patient investing from from Professor McDonald at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I think, as Larry said, some of the people on this call have probably either taken his class or tried to take his class. It's very hard to get into his class. He taught us to be fundamentally oriented, focus on people, and be very, very patient with them. And that's very hard to do in venture capital because venture capital in Silicon Valley, we like to say it's like a high school party. Everybody's trying to figure out where the cool kids are. Let's go to where the cool kids are. Oop, the party's over there now. And we were never invited to that party. We were definitely not the cool kids, both, both in real life and as a metaphor. Um, so we all, you know, we were on the outside. We had to do our own thing. And so we were looking for things that were a little bit different and we were willing to take a different approach and be very patient with them. And Roblox is one of those companies that we found way back in 2008. Uh, we made our first investment, million and a half dollars in February of 2008. That was more than 13 years ago. And wow. as you know, they just went public a couple months ago. So it's been a long journey, but it's been one of the most fulfilling journeys for us because we found a, a founder and a mission that we really just love. I mean, this, this is one that that is really impacting the world in, in a big and positive way. There are hundreds of millions of kids on this platform who are playing together, learning together, learning to code and, and learning to be civil to each other in an online environment. And so we feel like we have a big responsibility here because we've over that time become the largest shareholder of the company. Um, it's in the Wall Street Journal. We've invested more than $400 million into, into that company since our 1.5 and that $400 million I think today is worth eight billion. Um, so that's all. That's all kind of public information. And what, what, one of the things we learned is that these these big things become bigger than we ever think. And so it's it's just such a pleasure to be able to work with these founders, these companies as they build out their vision, as they build out these opportunities. Um, another thing we talk about is. 
um, the, the different kind of errors that we can make along the way. And this was one of the questions that came from the audience uh, before the call was, was that there, there's kind of two types of errors that people talk about, Sorry. errors of omission and errors of commission. Sorry. And I think Larry was very generous when he Sorry. said, Sorry. you know, we had made a number of mistakes before. Uh, I think we had made so many mistakes that they probably figured out there are no more mistakes that they could make and law of averages would, would take over and we would have some successes. Uh, Little did he know we actually had had more mistakes to come. We can talk about that later. Um, the the most people think making a bad investment is the worst thing you can do in venture capital, but actually the worst thing you can do is missing out on a great investment. And so, uh, and that applies to even your own companies. We we invested that one and a half million, but if we didn't invest the other four hundred million afterwards, we'd be in a very different position now. So, uh, the errors of omission can be much greater and, and much more painful, uh, both emotionally and financially. Uh, I'll share one, one story that's related to this audience here. There was a class of 2006 student that I was lucky enough to be the alumni mentor for when he was at Stanford GSB. And he had come from China. He, was, uh, he had worked for Motorola as a human resources manager. And so he knew nothing about startups or venture capital. He would come down Sand Hill Road to our office, right? And sit in the, in the conference room where Ho is sitting right now. And once a month, I would teach him about startups. Mm -hmm. And after he graduated in 2006, he went to Singapore where his wife was to a new country and said, I'm going to start a company. And he called me up and, and said, would you like to invest? And I said, well, you know, Forrest, I really don't know anything about Singapore. It's outside of our mandate. We don't do, we don't do seed, all these reasons, right? Well, his company is called C, S-E-A, and it's now a $100 billion public company. It is the largest tech company in Southeast Asia. So, boy, that is a painful thing that I'm reminded about every time I look at their stock price. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. So, obviously, we, we read about it. You guys were in the Wall Street Journal recently. Tremendous success. And a lot of it based on this model that you guys have of investing in people, um, thinking about the long term, building early habits, and then this idea of just continuous learning, both for you guys, for you guys, but also for your companies. Um, you know, if you think about it in terms of managing success, because that's where you guys are, are right now. What what's keeping you guys motivated? Now I'll, I'll end with that question in terms of what's keeping you guys motivated and sort of what's next for you. And before we turn it over to the Q and A, okay? So I'll, I'll, each one of you could just sort of respond to this idea of. You know, what's keeping you guys motivated and what are you guys looking forward to? So before I answer that, we ask the same exact question of our founders, mm -hmm. right? And it's really interesting to see their journeys. And we've had now, you know, several founders become billionaires or multi-billionaires, and we're going to have a few more. And along that journey, at some point, the light bulb kind of goes off. They realize, oh, um, I'm going to be really rich <laughs> or I'm really wealthy. And, you know, they don't, they don't really, it doesn't register, but the light bulb goes off. And then you sort of see, well, what do they do with that information? Right. And, and, you know, for some folks, you might see that, Hey, you know, they want to, and now they know what re they really want to do with their lives and they have the freedom to go do it. They should do that. They should absolutely do that. And then there are other folks that realize okay, well, that's really nice, but like, this is it for me. This is my life. This is what I love to do. And I'm going right back to work, right? And at some point it is no longer about the money. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of funny because some LPs started asking us this question a number of years ago, because maybe they saw some of the, 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 the metrics and they said, hey, you guys are going to make a lot of money. Like, like what's, what's driving you? Asking us similar kind of questions. And we thought, why are you asking us this question? It's like, it's all paper gains, you know? It's like, like we haven't, you know, these companies hadn't gone public yet. It's like, yeah, no, we're still working pretty damn hard. You know, we don't really have that much money. It's all paper. And, but, but it got us to start to think about this over the last several years. And, you know, he, here we are. We, I think we're on the same exact journey as some of our founders and they're loving what they're doing. And I think we are kind of, we are just hitting our stride. You know, as Bezos says, wow, it's like still day it, one. And, and look, you know, we're all doing different work with various nonprofits and so on. That's a very important part of kind of what our families are doing. But at the same time, I've, I've spent enough time with these nonprofits to know that 
my contribution to this world is not going to be serving on any more nonprofit boards. It's helping these entrepreneurs. And whether it works out or not, if it doesn't work out, if we don't make any money, that's fine. That's part of my pro bono work, right? And if it does work out, and uh, it, you know, the few successes more than pay the bills. And, and it, we're very, very fortunate to be doing what we're doing. So I'll pause there. Connor Anthony? Yeah, I think on, on that theme of learning, um, my father, who, who was a, uh, grew up in a village in Southern China and came to the United States to go to school, taught me that there's kind of three phases in life. Like this is a very Asian traditional way of thinking. The first third of your life you're learning, the second third of your life you are earning. And then the third third part, the last third of your life, you're enjoying and giving back. And unfortunately he passed away when he was 57. So he never made it to that last third. Hmm. So that model sucks is what I concluded when after he passed away. I was like, that's a really bad model. So if you can turn that serial model on the side and in parallel, always be learning, always be earning and always be giving back and enjoying what you're doing, well, that is a great life. And I think that is what Ho and Han and I have been able to put together here after many trials and tribulations, many more of which we haven't even talked about. I mean, we, we barely made it through 2008. We barely made it through 2014. In 2014, we, we raised a $14 million fund. So um, oh. there was a lot more to it than, than this story and the Roblox story. I mean, they were a pretty boring company for about 10 years in the middle there. So. Um, I, I think one of the things is really enjoying what we do in that way because we're always able to learn. And then the second thing I would say is our definition of success has kind of changed. Um, we used to think it was very successful when someone else uh, you know, invested in one of our companies at a higher valuation, a, a famous fund as, as Han said earlier. Uh, and then we thought, oh wow, it was so successful if one of our companies became a quote unquote unicorn, became worth a billion dollars. And then we thought, wow, it's so great now if a company can make a billion in revenue, not just valuation. And then now, our, more recently we thought, wow, isn't it great that one of our entrepreneurs, one of our founders that we've been with for 10, 20, 15 years can become a billionaire by, by building this company from scratch. And then the, the most interesting one and the one that's happening now is seeing our successful founders give back billions, donate billions, um, the founder of Wuwa, who Han talked about, he became the first Korean to sign the giving pledge. And uh, we helped, helped him out in that process. And we have other founders who are now philanthropists, literally giving back the billions that, that they had made during the struggle. Thanks, Anthony. Han? You know, I don't have any more eloquent comments after what Anthony said. <laughs> Well, okay, I, I guess I'll do a wrap before we go to Q&A. There's just so much to absorb. I had goosebumps uh, frequently throughout this the conversation. What a wonderful conversation. Um, they're thinking I've got the best idea in the world and I wanted to find some group of folks to actually go on a journey with me. Hell, I, I would have you guys in the trenches with me. And, and when we're putting the flag up on the hill, the, you would be the guys. And so I, I think that's amazing. For the audience, I started out by saying, you know, let's look at it from the perspective of what was untold. What were the untold heroes, untold supporters like Larry, untold moments where you, you think, hey, all VC funds make a ton of money, right? Let's all go into venture capital. I, I actually remember how back in 94, 95, you know, when we were graduating from business school, no one, I mean, what was venture capital? <laughs> it's kind of a strange animal, right? Um, and now it's so popular, but this idea to actually get to where you guys got to and all the near-death experiences, um, just at, at the untold stories of those, okay? And how the the untold lessons that you guys learn and, and the continuous learning that came from it, you know, is, is truly incredible. And I feel like, uh, Han, you were talking about how, uh, you know, you get to meet with great people and their potential head speakers in the future or visionaries. I feel the very same way uh, having this conversation with you guys. So thank you guys for what you guys are doing for the community. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ivy, who's got probably 400 questions because we have 700 people online listening to this. So Ivy, to you. Thank you, Soon. 
And the first question actually goes to Larry. So Larry, what has been your experience founding and leading Fairview Capital with the conviction and the mission to support underrepresented groups? And how has that thinking made your firm different from your, your, from your peers? I'll say for, thank you, Ivy, for the question. Um, I would like to say that um, um, our path in this business has spawned uh, multiple imitators. Um, it's not true. There have been uh, a few. There have been some that have come and gone, quite frankly. Um, we would deem success seeing uh, many more and even greater success, quite frankly, seeing the capital markets begin to behave in the manner in which we're all taught in school they behave, that capital flows to compelling ideas and really talented people. And if you marry the two, capital will follow, <clears throat> irrespective of, of superficial uh, sort of phenotype and again, packaging. Um, it has been, quite frankly, a, a challenging path, uh, Ivy. I mentioned that we closed our first fund back in 1994, just shy of 100 million. And while we managed uh, 10 billion today, and while I, I could say truthfully, capital raising over that time has gotten a bit easier, it has not gotten easy. And it's still the case today um, where we find uh, even after <clears throat> 27 years and a very long track record now of funds that have outperformed, um, you would think that the capital would simply flow. And that's, that's just not the case. And we don't spend a lot of time thinking about or dwelling on that. Um, we simply believe in what we're doing. We've got a team of really talented, uh, capable people in our firm that we all enjoy working with one another. We get really charged when we're able to back a team like the Altos team, and they go on and demonstrate exactly what you know, our thesis was all about. Um, just really talented people uh, finding terrific uh, opportunities and entrepreneurs and backing them and building world-class companies. Um, so as long as we can continue to, 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 to do that, uh, Ivy, I think we'll stay on the playing field. And we've been fortunate to layer our firm with you know, kind of multi-generations of talent, if you will. At some point, my partner and I will, you know, step to the sidelines. But like the Altos guys, we enjoy what we're doing. And as long as we're doing it and we're not dribbling in our soup and our younger partners aren't asking us to, <laughs> you know, be pushed out the door, uh, we'll continue doing it. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Larry, for the sharing. It's a pleasure. Hey, Larry, uh, you raise a really fascinating point. You guys have an amazing track record, 27 years, and yet fundraising is still not easy. And, you know, I've kind of come to the conclusion that there are, you know, you can't let that bother you, basically. There are, there are exactly. so many people today with Warren Buffett's 50-some year track record saying, oh, he doesn't get it, like whatever, you know, like, like people will kind of that their people are irrational. I mean, you talked about they they are irrational. So they there are people like Larry and, and many others uh, who were part of our first couple of funds that backed us with no track record or maybe a bad track record, right? And then now that we have this amazing track record, I will tell you there are still people who will find all kinds of reasons to not invest in us, and we we basically learned to not take that personally at all. It's just, you know, good luck. You know, everybody kind of has their own approach and they will rationalize and they will use the data in whatever way they want to support whatever they want to believe in. Right. And so people are irrational and you just have to believe in what you're doing and you got to go for it. And, you know, if they're going to be always naysayers, right. It doesn't matter. Like you're going to achieve some level of success and you think everybody is going to think you're great. It's like, no, 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 I don't think so. You know, they're always doubters, always naysayers, and you just can't let that bother you because, you know, it's, it's their life. Let them live it the way they're going to live it. You live your own life, you know. Could not agree more, Ho. <laughs> Thanks, Ho. 
Well, we talked about the importance of relationships earlier in this discussion. And we're wondering, um, have your experience or your cultural backgrounds um, made you think differently about managing relationships, whether they be with your portfolio companies, with founders, with LPs, and with um, all your stakeholders? I, there's many different ways to answer that question, Ivy. I think one thing I would say is that, and maybe this is the immigrant mentality of it a little bit, we never give up. Uh, as you could tell from our fundraising story and our and our multiple lives as a partnership story, we never gave up on ourselves and each other, and we never give up on our entrepreneurs. Um, there are companies that we've been with now for 10, 15 more years that are actually quite small. They've never really gotten that big. And we're still, you know, we still owe it to them to work with them. We love working with them. Uh, we call ourselves or we've been called cockroaches. <laughs> we just keep at it. We survived nuclear winter a few times and we just keep at it. And sometimes when you keep at it long enough, great things and lucky things happen. Actually, that dovetails very well to the next question, which speaks to your firm's longevity and resilience. So the economic and social environment have changed a lot over the past few decades. And Autos has stood strong after all these years. Were there any decisions, investment or otherwise, that you would make differently looking at looking back with the hindsight that you, you know now? Um, any things to avoid, uh, any risks or derailers to avoid, and, uh, and any uh, thesis that would have changed from your original thinking? You know, well, I think Anthony alluded to this a couple of times a little bit, mistakes of omission versus commission. I, I think the, look, in venture capital, you're never going to lose a billion dollars. You make these little five, $10 million investments, you know, it could go to zero or it could go to something big, but we've made multiple billion dollar mistakes, big mistakes. And those are uh, usually the mistakes of omission or basically selling too soon some of our companies. And so one of the key lessons that we learned is that it's not about the exits and people like Larry and many of our LPs, they want the liquidity. They need that cash back, right? Because the paper we saw in the bubble that the paper gains are worthless, right? You got to convert that. But what the, the key lesson we learned is you just have to build an amazing company. And if you do, you could get liquidity. There's lots of liquidity options for the founder, for employees, for investors, for our own LPs. We've had liquidity through dividends, through shareholder buybacks, through secondaries, long before the IPO, right? So uh, M&A, exit, or IPO is not the only path. If you have a great company, you can get liquidity. And so we no longer think about getting out. We think about building to keep. And if we build and have an amazing business, we'll be able to get liquidity if people want it. If they want to keep compounding on a pre-tax basis, that's even better. And that's kind of one of the key things that we learned along the way so that we will stop making these billion dollar mistakes, right? So Han was about to say something. I'll pass no, on. no, I mean, I, I think I think that's that's important in that I think sometimes we get involved. I th basically, we get involved with a business we like, but with a founder that's sort of questionable. And when that happens, a lot of our time basically gets sunk with that founder and it clouds our judgment in good companies or any good opportunities. And we miss out on those opportunities. And, and I think sort of, you know, that's something, you know, we keep telling ourselves that we shouldn't do. That's great. Yeah, well, yeah, when you get involved with the wrong people, it's not the money that you lose that's extremely costly. It's, it's the stress, it's the, the time sink that is going to prevent you from finding the next great deal. There's huge costs beyond losing money. And it's just not worth it to us. And so we're, we're just not going to do deals because we're going to make money. Like the last thing we need is to find another deal that just makes money. It's got to be about the people. It's got to be about the mission. And it's got to excite somebody on our team to say, I'm going to stick my neck out and I'm going to commit to this. And I'm going to work really hard with this company. I'm not going to let it go. And if we don't have a champion in our team to step up to that, the deal won't happen. It doesn't matter how much money we think we're going to make. Somebody has to step up to commit to that company and that founder. And, and for one of us to step up, it has to be something more than just making money, right? It's got to be something special that we're excited about. 
That's great. That also leads to the next question very well, which is, would you have any advice, especially given your experience and challenges uh, earlier in your career, any advice for uh, people from underrepresented groups, be it people of color or women or any groups that are currently underrepresented in the startup ecosystem? I, I think it just goes back to what I said, like you can't let what uh, the naysayers say bother you at all. There are going to be some people who are going to be skeptical of who you are and what you can do. And it doesn't matter if you have an amazing track record or if you've, if you've done so many things, they will find different excuses or reasons why, oh, well, you got lucky on that one and you're not going to repeat that success. You can't let that bother you. Um, and you just have to, you know, go out and, and you have to find your people basically, you know, it's quality over quantity, I think. Uh, I think that's kind of one of the things we've learned over time, we have both quantity and quality, but all we care about is quality, to be, to be honest. And, uh, you know, Larry's been to many of our annual meetings, I think more than 10 years ago, somebody made the comment, it's like, wow, these are kind of strange annual meetings, there's a lot of hugging going on, you know, it's uh, relationships and bonds with our founders and entrepreneurs and, and our LPs, we, we just value those relationships, it's just a lot more fun that way. Find your people and start from there. You don't have to convert everybody. And how do you discern that quality from your founder? Is it from the early conversations with them, with them, obviously before you invest, and even after you invest, continue to influence them in their thinking so that so that you're really shaping their character? Yeah, I think you know when we invest, it's not like one conversation or two, three conversation, it's multiple conversation. And it's not like any single person, it's multiple people within the partnership, spend time with the founder and the team. And then we try to get to, we try to get to know the entire team. And we talk about the team, we talk about sort of pluses and minuses. And, and then then we get excited. If we get excited, we invest. But after we invest, I think that's when we really get to know the founder a little bit better, right? We look at the decisions that they make uh, and we talk about those decisions. What Then we start to understand a little bit more about the founder in which basically it gets us less excited or more excited. Uh, about the business and the founder's long-term potential. And, and, you know, so it's a constant, I don't want to say evaluation, but it, you know, it's more of a fit between founder and us as well. Uh, and so there's, I'm sure the founder does the same thing uh, with our fund as well. So it's an evaluation process, both two ways. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of complicated. You know, it's like a marriage right? You know, we follow some of these companies for a decade or more. And in, in over the course of 10 years, people, you know, will make mistakes. There are many opportunities to disappoint each other. And you work through it and, and the relationship gets stronger, or it gets weaker. And if the relationship gets stronger, and the business is performing, those are the companies that were likely to double down, triple down, go really big. And there are other companies where we might make a lot of money, but it's not going to be one of those that we are going to be really loading up on. And we could all part ways as friends and we've, you know, we've made our money and then we move on. Right? But there are other relationships that endure sometimes across multiple companies. We've had, we have many folks that we work with across two, three, I don't know if we had a fourth one, but many people we've worked across multiple companies over the years. And it's just very enjoyable uh, to us. So. That's great. Uh, there's a question coming in live uh, uh, regarding any differences in terms of the way uh, startups pitch to you if they were coming from Asia versus coming from the US uh, and any differences in the way you evaluate them. I maybe you take that one. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think we go, we, we look at both businesses the same with the same lens. You know, we, we talk about, you know, why there's an opportunity, uh, you know, what opportunity is it? So we have to understand it. And then we talk about how big do we think it could be? How big does the entrepreneur think it could be? Uh, and then we say, you know, why is the oppor opportunity available now versus 
you know, five years ago or maybe five years from now. So we ask about that timing question. And then, then we evaluate the founder in terms of, or founding team, how good of a team is there to execute against the opportunity. And, and, and that's sort of the standard thing. I'm pretty sure every venture fund does and we do pretty much the same thing. And we try to get a little bit more at the character of the founder because I think we've been through so many companies that we just know a lot of difficult things will happen. The business will never go in straight line. And we have to ask ourselves, hey, is this the person we... And so we'll wrap our official Q&A period with one last question, which is what advice would you give to the recent graduating class and the next generation? This is the uh, graduating class uh, business school or college? What about both? Oh, my advice might be don't take my advice. <laughs> well, look, I, I'll go back to this. There are two things that we used to tell each other all the time. And I had to kind of bring it back from my memory bank because we don't say it these days. And the reason is we're not making these kinds of mistakes. And, and, and we had to kind of remind our younger generation in our team what they were. So there are two things. One was don't do stupid things. Now, it's like, that is like such a, what the hell does that mean? It's like, well, just think about what are the things that you can do that kind of will ruin your reputation or land you in jail or break relationships, break trust. What are the dumb things that you could possibly do? Well, stop doing it. That's one basic thing. There's a lot of stupidities in this world. And we used to kind of say, don't do those things. Don't do stupid things. There's a lot of bad behavior, including burning a lot of money and, and hosing too much money into little companies too soon that screws up the culture and you never get a chance to build a great one. So that's one. The, the other is something that Han used to say all the time. He doesn't say it anymore because I think we've gotten better probably. And it's just like, it is what it is. He used to always say that. It's like, it is what it is, you know, whatever. If something upsets you, something, you know, takes you off your game or whatever it is, like, like why, why are you fretting over this thing, right? You have to accept it, accept reality for what it is. And because we went through so many difficult times, I think that's when, uh, that's why Han used to say that a lot. At least I remember that. It is what it is. Like, deal with it, right? So those are two like little things that we used to say a lot within our partnership way back when, we no longer say those kinds of things, but those are two very important basic pieces of advice that I would encourage people to think about. No, you know, I, I, it's, it's funny. It's, um, we used to, I used to talk about that with Jack McDonald uh, and, and Jack always said, hey, admitting the reality is sort of, or mistake or reality is the first step towards fixing whatever you've done wrong, right? So without admitting it, there's no way you're gonna be able to fix anything. So we actually look for that in the uh, entrepreneurs. You know, do they actually tell the reality as is, or do they tell the reality as they hope the reality might be? And it's a very important distinction. It's, it is a intellectual honesty. So you, we want that intellectual honesty from all the entrepreneurs. But like if, if somebody's graduating from college, I would say go to a place where they work you like 120 hours a week. I mean, I think you, you deserve to be at a place where you just work hard. And I think there's something to be gained by being at a place where you just work so hard and it, it gets ingrained in you. And I think it's, you know, maybe the best habit you will have for the rest of your life. If my girls really adhere to that, but. Well, thank you again, Ho, Han, Anthony, and Larry. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience, insights, wisdom with us this evening. And Chris, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Ivy. 
Thank you, Ho, Han, Anthony, and Larry for an inspired conversation. Your candor and generosity in sharing your experience and wisdom demonstrate that our communities are stronger when we work together. The Altos origin story, its humble beginnings, seeking unlikely allies, applying lessons learned from the tough times, and managing success in a humble and service frame of mind are lessons that we can all take to our minds and our hearts. And thank you again, Soon and Ivy, for your panel and Q&A moderation. It was fantastic. A video of today's panel will be made available later this month. Our next GSB Asian Alumni Chapter event is only a week away. We will be hosting a panel titled From Anger to Action, a roundtable with Asian CEOs. This panel will feature the CEOs of Ancestry, OpenTable, and Hyphen Capital, leaders who will share their observations and personal experiences with bias and discrimination. Learn how they translate their anger with anti-Asianism into productive actions that will drive short and long-term impactful changes at home, at work, and in the community. The speakers will share their recommendations for what Asians and allies uh, can do. I'll post the link in the chat box in a bit. And on a related note, um, my GSB classmate, Norman Chen, co-founder and chief executive of the nonprofit Leading Asian Americans to Unite for Change, or also called Launch, recently released a landmark survey that is among the most comprehensive of its kind to assess attitudes about Asian Americans, who number close to 23 million in the United States today. I'll also post a link to that report uh, in the chat box and encourage you to take a look at that. So as we come to the 90 minute mark, I'd like to thank all of you, all our attendees for joining tonight. And I hope we see you again soon. For those of you who'd like to stay on a little while longer, we'll pivot to an optional off the record, extra 15 minutes or so of Q&A that Ivy and Soon will lead. Ivy and Soon, you can take it from here and I'll pause and stop the record button. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, See you everybody. Good night. Good night.